In the 1662 Book of Common Prayer, there's an exhortation that a priest gives to a sick person when he goes to visit them on their sickbed. And in that exhortation, it says this, Dearly beloved, know this, that Almighty God is the Lord of life and death, and of all things to them pertaining, as youth, strength, health, age, weakness, and sickness. Wherefore, whatsoever your sickness is, know you certainly that it is God's visitation. God's visitation. How often do we think of sickness and weakness as God being with us, visiting us? And for that matter, what about trials and anxieties and losses, betrayal? Can these be God's visitation? Most often, when we imagine difficult times, all that may come to mind is how to avoid such experiences or how to solve the problem that they present us. But learning to embrace those negative experiences through praying the Psalms of lament can bring us to a place in our lives where even the darkest moments we face, we see them no longer as outside of God's awareness, care, and keeping not because He provides us an answer to our sorrow, but because He provides Himself, His very presence in the midst of disorienting circumstances. So welcome to this fifth session of our psalm study, Truthful Speech is Common Prayer. In this session, we will be looking more closely at one of those psalms of lament, Psalm 6, and seeing how it can train us to trust that God is present even when we walk through hard times. In fact, when we pray Psalm 6, we will be trained to lament well by seeing that love is a severe mercy, not a mere kindness. Evil is a power to be overcome, not a problem to solve. Feelings are informative, not irrational. And God is present even when He seems far off. Let's begin by looking at the first three verses of Psalm 6 where we're trained to see that God's love is a severe mercy, not just mere kindness. O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled. But you, O Lord, how long? First, it's important not to skip over those first two words, O Lord. What that means is this lament psalm is not some kind of indulging in self-pity. It's not a venting session. It's not some kind of wishing upwards with no particular hope of satisfaction. Instead, it's a complaint made to a God who cares, a God who can do something about what the psalmist is going through. King David comes to God with his sorrow, and like that infant we talked about last time who is well attached to his mother, he trusts that his cries and complaints for help, for satisfaction, will be answered. Now, as we make our way through the rest of those first three verses, we bump up into some ideas, into some words that can be hard for us modern people. God's rebuke, God being angry, God's discipline, God rebuking us. I mean, isn't God love? What do we do with this? Well, as C.S. Lewis points out in his book, The Problem of Pain, often when we think of love, we think of what Lewis calls mere kindness, by which Lewis means we have an image of God, not as a father in heaven, but as a grandfather in heaven. He, he says a senile benevolence who says of anything that we might want to do, what does it matter so long as they're content? The problem with thinking of love in this very thin sort of way is that, I mean, well, no one thinks of love in that way. If you're a parent and you have a child, you don't think of loving them in that way. But even if you're a child now grown up, you don't think of loving your spouse that way. You want what's best for, best for them. Even your parents as adults, you want what's best for them. 
So sometimes love looks tougher than just mere kindness. Or as Lewis goes on to say, love is something more stern and splendid than mere kindness. In fact, God himself is love. He doesn't just do loving things for his creation. And God cannot and does not change. So if God is love, that's good news. But going back to our question, what do we make of this rebuke, this discipline, this anger? Well, when we see that in Scripture, we need to see God's unchangeableness. It must be our starting point when we start thinking about questions about God's rebuke and anger. So that when we see God's emotional involvement with His people in Scripture, we need to understand it figuratively, relatively from a human perspective. Just as the sun seems to move across the sky during the day, when in reality it's actually the earth is the object that's moving, so God's emotional changeability is an effect of human perspective, says the scholar Michael Ward. Our God is love, but that love is a consuming fire, as the writer of Hebrews says. And sometimes that fire warms us and comforts us, but sometimes it burns, depending on our relationship to it, depending on where we are relative to it. Or to finish with Lewis's words once again, if God is love, he is by definition something more than mere kindness. Though he has often rebuked us and condemned us, he has never regarded us with contempt. He has paid the intolerable compliment of loving us in the deepest, most tragic, most inexorable sense. God loves his people too much to be that senile benevolence that we often like children think that we want. Just like any good father or mother, God wants what's best for his children. And so sometimes his love shows up like a severe mercy. Now, moving on to verses four through five, we see that Psalm six also trains us to lament well by seeing that evil is a power to be overcome, not a problem to be solved. Turn, O Lord, deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In Sheol, who will give you praise? Here we turn to this cry for deliverance coming from King David. This is his petition that's often given in a lament psalm. And it's clear that David understands in the words of one commentator that he's not just committed some bad actions and done some bad things. Or, as it may be the case, because the circumstances of the psalm aren't exactly that clear, it's not just that some bad things have been done to him. Either way, what is clear is that sin and brokenness are a power by which a person or systems are held helplessly in thrall, in the words of Fleming Rutledge. In other words, more information and learning can't help in this realm. Better planning, better strategy and execution don't help when we're in the grip of a power that we have no power over. Only the God who created heaven and earth, the God who has the power to speak life into existence, to raise the dead, this God that is also intimately involved with his people and commits himself to them because that's what he does, because he's love, only he can help. St. Augustine wrestled with the mystery of evil for most of his life. And to him, evil was irrational. It didn't make sense. It had no internal logic of its own, but it had to steal life from the good that God had created in order to survive. And as Augustine says, before his conversion, he says, I tried to find the source of evil, but I got nowhere. He recounts in his confessions how he and some of his buddies made a midnight raid on a neighbor's pear orchard, and they stole some pears just because, just because they could. He and his friends even ended up throwing the pears to some pigs. 
The point is, Augustine saw that evil had no end. It had no goal. And as he says of that event in his youth, I became evil for no reason. He didn't steal the pears to satisfy a hunger, even though stealing in that case might have been understandable, though not justifiable, but he stole them just for the heck of it. But once Augustine was converted, once he encountered the God that is as close as his own soul, the God he could trust, a personal God, he saw that evil was less a problem to be solved, like an algebra problem, and instead was a power that had to be defeated. The answer to the problem of evil for Augustine in the end was in fact not an answer at all. It was an action, an action of the same God that King David is praying to, a God who can do something about evil, and in fact a God who did something about evil, a God who shows up in history in the person of Jesus Christ and dies on a cross so that in the words of James K.A. Smith, commenting on this period in Augustine's life, sin isn't answered, it's overcome. That is what you and I need when we're in a season of lament. Whether we feel sorrow and helplessness because of our own sin and we are repenting, or whether we feel helpless and sorrow because of someone's sin against us, or whether we see sin in the world and brokenness and it's too much and it's too overwhelming. We need the power of a personal God found in Jesus Christ who alone has the power to rescue us from such helpless situations. This God is the one King David is appealing to here. The God who even before the incarnation was intimately involved with his people, condescended to save them, and rescue them against enemies and against the evil that emerged in their own hearts. Evil that's too big and powerful just to be answered and that instead can only be lamented and grieved before God. So that as it is lamented and grieved, a way is prepared to wait for God to rescue. Now, moving on to verses six and seven, we see that Psalm 6 teaches us to lament well by revealing how our emotions can be informative, not irrational. The imagery used here in these verses suggests how carefully David pays attention to his emotional state, how he doesn't try to just skip past his sorrow. Let's look at what he says in those verses. I am weary from my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. My eye wastes away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. Fellow Anglican priest and writer Tish Harrison Warren, in an article she wrote on the Psalms a number of months back in Christianity Today, notes how the philosopher Martha Nussbaum calls emotions hot cognitions because they give us information, and information that is even true, if we take the time to sit with them and hear what they may be saying beneath the surface. David, I think, is doing that here. Night after night, he says, he floods his bed with tears. Now, this is hyperbole, of course, but this figure of speech reveals an insistence in David to sit with his feelings, not to anesthetize them, not to blame others with them, or not even to fight back against his enemies. Instead, he pays attention to what he's feeling, he directs his complaint to God, and he channels his emotions into covenantal shapes, as one commentator calls them, by laying his grief before the Lord, who is the one who has promised to bless and keep him. And when you and I pray these lines, we can be formed to do the same thing. Now, we have to stop here for just a second because I suspect that like me, you've been trained not to trust your feelings and for the most part with good reason. But as Pastor Mark Allen Shelsky says, our feelings always tell us the truth, just not the truth we think they're telling us. 
What David is doing here before God by paying attention to his feelings, and I might add, feeling them in God's presence, this is very instructive for us. Because what we see here is he's not in a rush to get past this negative experience. He's able to pay attention to what he deeply wants when he calls out for God's rescue. I want to repeat that. He's able to pay attention to what he most deeply wants when his voice is calling out for God's rescue. He may be calling out for enemies to be routed and turned back, or circumstances to change, but there's a deeper need to discover as he waits in his sorrow, which is not just for a problem to be solved, but it's a presence to be with him that he most wants. Praying these lines in verses six and seven, it forces you and me to slow down, and to pay attention to our own emotional life. Again, not so we can vent, not so we can just wallow, but so that we can be informed, so that we can lay our entire selves, not only the thoughts of our hearts, but also the depths of our souls, where the cry for God's presence lives and moves and has its being. Now, finally, as we look at the last verses, verses eight through 10 of Psalm six, we see that not only is God's love a severe mercy, not only is evil a power that he must overcome, and not only are our emotions informative for us, but we finally see that God is present, even when he feels far off. Let's read those last verses together. Depart from me, all you workers of evil, for the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. Here we come to that turn in the lament psalm. This is where, as we said last time, the psalmist is reminded that the Lord is with him. He has not abandoned him. This is that calling to mind we talked about. And it's clear that something happens in that gap between verse seven and verse eight. We don't know exactly what it is, but it's clear that David knows his cry of complaint and sorrow has been heard. The Lord's not far off. And even though his circumstances perhaps remain the same, and even though he's still surrounded by enemies, the Lord is near. David here calls out those enemies, those workers of evil, who are, as we said in session two, not just people that we don't like or happen to find disagreeable, or people on the other side of the political aisle. These are people who actively work against God's righteousness in the world. And David says, these enemies shall be greatly ashamed now that his focus has been reoriented to this God that is with him. And this suggests that the shaming is in the future. It suggests that his situation has not necessarily changed. Now, again, talk of enemies can be off-putting maybe for us as modern people. And yet the Psalms assume that we will have some. Even still, you might be the type of person who doesn't have many conflicts and naturally doesn't get ruffled by other people's opinions or personalities. But there's still a lesson here for you and honestly for me. As Jesus says in St. Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount, woe to you when everyone speaks well of you. Our Lord's words here in Luke's gospel should give us pause. You may be predisposed to keeping the peace, which is a real gift. But if we ever find ourselves assuming that a lack of enemies and conflict in our lives means that we are living the fully alive life, then we need to meditate on the lament Psalms, on Psalm 6, on Jesus' words here in Luke's gospel. And we need to meditate on the fact that, as we said in our first session, Jesus himself, whose ministry was marked by consistent encounters with enemies, who not only just didn't agree with him, they plotted against him and tried to end his life and eventually did. He patiently endured misrepresentation. He patiently endured being misunderstood even as he went to the cross, even when he could have, with a word, 
helped everyone see exactly who he was in a single instant. He showed us a more excellent way so that whether you're the type that naturally has enemies or not, Jesus shows us, as I think this psalm shows us, how to deliberately practice being known only to God. And that's the way to being fully alive, even in the midst of conflict and trial. This is the security, I think, David finds as he prays this prayer that we see emerge in these final verses. As he endures God's severe mercy, as he wrestles with evil, as he lays his emotions and sits with them before God, the deepest satisfaction he can find for his need in this lament comes from being known only by God. This is why David is able to say, the Lord has heard the sound of his weeping because the Lord has always been with him. He never changes and he's never left. David has been rescued from a wrong perspective. He's been rescued from needing his enemies to see him as only the Lord can. That is, as the Lord's chosen one, as the one in whom he delights. Not because of David's lovability, but because God is love. Now for us, we who have been adopted in Christ, in Christ, we are God's beloved children. Even when circumstances may seem to tell us otherwise. And in these final verses of Psalm 6, we can see a kind of pointing forward to those comforting words of St. Paul in Romans chapter 8 that say this, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. When we learn to pray a lament psalm like Psalm 6, we can be trained to embrace the conditions of our lament as God's visitation, God meeting us in our pain. And when we pray these psalms faithfully, and don't ignore them, they will give us the words we need in our time of need, and they will form us to direct our complaints, our confessions, even our cursings to the God who is with us and has promised salvation to those who wait for him.